The V-Force was a legendary team of bombers built to serve during the post-war crisis. However, they would not carry ordinary bombs, but nuclear weapons. As World War II ended, the division between the West and the East became a significant threat to world peace, and shortly before the Cold War began, Britain started working on a modern jet bomber force that could rival any other on the planet. The Handley Page Victor featured a one-of-a-kind wing, making it the largest aircraft up to that point to break the sound barrier. As the British mastered the atomic bomb by the mid-1950s with the exceptional V-Force and the Victor to deliver it, Britain's stature among the world's superpowers significantly solidified. Peacetime. During the last months of World War II, the Royal Air Force's Bomber Command peaked in both size and power. After the unarmed Mosquito proved serviceable beyond expectations, it rendered heavy bombers more vulnerable than ever. In addition, the Messerschmitt 262, the first jet fighter to operate around the globe, set the standard configuration of swept wings and jet engines, marking the beginning of a new era in aviation. Parallel to these events in Europe, the war in the Far East dragged on, as the unstoppable Japanese forces would not surrender. In the meanwhile, the Allies were secretly working on the most destructive weapon ever created by mankind. During peacetime in Europe, there were significant cuts in military funding, despite the paranoia regarding the Russians and the East. Many aeronautical research projects were either cut or cancelled, and within a year from the end of the war, Britain had lost its leadership in the aviation industry. The Lincoln Jet, the successor to the Lancaster, was slower than modern aircraft of its kind. Its range was also unsatisfactory, and it was inadequate to carry the most important new weapon of the British arsenal, the nuclear bomb. While the Americans leased several B-29s to their allies, they soon became obsolete. Meanwhile, the first Allied jet, the Gloucester Meteor, was discouraging but set the basis for further developments. The Air Ministry required a jet bomber as soon as possible. They were already working on the Canberra, but it could only carry 6,000 pounds, and they needed 10,000. By January of 1947, the specifications were defined. The bomber needed to penetrate enemy defenses at a high altitude and at high speed, while also evading interceptors. However, the most important demand was that it needed to deliver a nuclear bomb. A historic rivalry emerged between developers, leading to a powerful group of aircraft later known as the V-Force. First came the Avro Vulcan, then the Vickers Valiant, and then the elegant Handley Page Victor. This legendary trio was ready to fight in the uneasy times of the post-war, right before the Berlin Wall was built and the Cold War officially commenced. Evolution When Germany finally fell, the Allies benefited from the aeronautical knowledge that their scientists had gathered, especially advances in the turbojet engine and a sleek new type of wing found at the Arado Flugzeugwerke GmbH factory. The innovative design impressed the staff from Handley Page, who was sent to Arado and found something that revolutionized their work, the Crescent Wing. The prevailing need for higher speed, maneuverability, and range propelled the development of a compound wing configuration unlike anything built at the time. Whereas thinner wings enabled faster speeds, they were unreliable in carrying heavy loads. Ideally, a razor-sharp leading edge would cut through the air resistance, but in practice, only a stouter wing could bear the weight of a nuclear bomb. Thicker wings produced an unwanted drag at high speeds, which was lowered by an angled sweep. The deeper the sweep, the thicker the wing could be without interfering too much with the airflow. Nevertheless, the deeper the wing angle, the shorter the wing span, which caused another issue, induced drag. Consequently, the groundbreaking invention was a wing that embodied the best qualities of each type. The wing roots had an angle as deep as that of a delta wing, while the middle section had a softer angle and the tip had the mildest sweep. Furthermore, the inner section was considerably thicker than the tips, offering a valuable solution to the former restrictions. Another attribute of the crescent configuration was that the combined angles added up to a stiffer wing, which performed better at higher altitudes because it wasn't bent as easily as conventional designs. Finally, an unforeseen advantage was that the aerodynamically advanced wing significantly helped pilots when landing, as the distribution of forces on the wing surface and tail compensated for the weight, positioning the aircraft in a nose-up attitude without the pilot even touching the controls. Development by 1945, it was evident to the Handley Page team that the Royal Air Force would soon replace the Lincoln, so they prepared a formal proposal. The design was designated HP-80. The team was unfamiliar with the Delta Wing, so they decided to test the unique Crescent Wing. 
The company's aerodynamicists then developed the first crescent-shaped swept wing, which author Bill Gunston described as, quote, undoubtedly the most efficient high subsonic wing on any drawing board in 1947. The Victor, in fact, would be the only crescent wing type aircraft to enter production. Both the HP-80 and the Type 698 by Avro were chosen as the top two proposals. However, there were many risks in the two modern designs, and Vickers Valiant was ultimately selected as a safer alternative, despite not meeting all the requirements. In April of 1948, the company signed a contract for two prototypes. A one-third scale glider was then built to test the wing concept, in addition to a supermarine attacker that was modified for its new purpose. The models were designated HP-87 and HP-88, respectively. However, the latter crashed not long after and didn't contribute much helpful information. The aircraft was powered by four Armstrong Siddeley Sapphire turbojets, which provided 7,500 pounds of thrust each. Like with its sister aircraft, the engines were deeply buried in the wing roots. The Royal Air Force then advised that the tailplane be moved to the top fin rather than built in the middle. The first prototype, WB-771, was built at Radlett, where it was supposed to be flown for the first time. However, there were concerns that the runway would not be long enough, and the airframe was subsequently broken down and disguised as a boat. The different sections were hidden under wooden frames stamped Gelly Pandy Southampton. This legend made it appear as though the airframe was actually a boat hull being transported to Boscombe Down, with Gully Pandy being an anagram for Handley Page. The aircraft was then rebuilt discreetly in preparation for its maiden flight, and finally, on Christmas Eve 1952, it took to the air, commanded by Handley Page's chief test pilot, Hadley Hazelton. Test pilot John Allen would then express that, quote, it was immediately a super piece of equipment to fly and comfortable, and you felt at home with it straight away. About a week later, the Air Ministry announced the aircraft's official name. It would be known as the Victor, and its public debut would be on July 15, 1953, at the Queen's Coronation Review. Operational History The Victor became operational in 1958, completing the V-Force. The aircraft were powered by Armstrong Siddeley Sapphire ASSA-7 turbojets. They were initially deployed with the Blue Danube, and later with the mighty Yellow Sun nuclear weapons. In addition, Victors used to carry American Mark V nuclear bombs and Red Beard weapons. An upgraded version, the B-1A, featured the Red Steer tail radar, a suite of radar warning receivers, and electronic countermeasures. On June 1, 1956, Allen inadvertently broke the sound barrier while flying Victor XA-917. The test pilot let the nose drop slightly while at a higher power setting and exceeded the speed of sound. Observers on the ground witnessed a sonic boom, and the signal indicated Mach 1.1 in the cockpit. The Victor always remained stable and became the largest aircraft to have broken the sound barrier at the time. Another version was developed when the Royal Air Force required an even higher ceiling for its bombers. Hence, the intakes had to be redesigned and enlarged, while the wing tips were extended to increase the wingspan. The Victor B-2 was then accepted into the Air Force. The B-2 was powered by Conway RCO-11 engines and equipped with so-called elephant ear intakes on the rear fuselage, which fed ram air to ram air turbines. This, in turn, could power the aircraft during emergencies. The new model flew for the first time in February of 1959 and entered service three years later after minor modifications. Eventually, 21 B-2s were upgraded to B-2Rs to carry blue steel nuclear missiles, while some others were also converted for strategic reconnaissance missions. In addition to cameras and radar mapping systems, these aircraft included sniffers to detect particles released from nuclear tests. The Victor would eventually replace its sister aircraft, the Valiant, in late 1964. Due to metal fatigue at the time, the Royal Air Force had no frontline tankers. Consequently, the new strategic bomber was refitted, and six of these Victors became operational by April the following year. After switching the nuclear deterrent from the Royal Air Force to the Royal Navy with its Polaris missile, the remaining B-2s were modified to the K-2 standard, and in 1982, they fought in the Falklands War. The Victor remained in service as a tanker until late 1993, and only four models survive on display across the United Kingdom. Thanks for watching our video. Please like and subscribe to all our Dark Documentaries channels for more historical information about the World Wars and their aircraft. And let us know if you have any topic suggestions in the comments below.